the Buddha once said that one of, one of the teacher's duties is to provide protection for the student in all directions. Of course, that doesn't mean that the teacher runs around with a sword and a shield trying to keep dangers away. The teacher provides the students with the knowledge of what should and shouldn't be done. And if you follow that advice, you'll be protected. Of course, you want the right advice. There's another place where the Buddha was critical of some other teachers at the time, whose teachings basically denied that action had any power or that your actions had any real results or that you had any control over your life at all. That everything that you were going to experience was already predetermined. And as I said, that kind of teaching leaves no grounds for any idea of what should or shouldn't be done. There are no shoulds or should nots. And when there's no should or should not, you have no protection. You're left unprotected. Because it's your actions that protect you. And your strong sense of what should and shouldn't be done. Because the mind is constantly acting. It's always doing. And its actions really do have an impact on its life. On the pleasure and pain that it experiences. And so it needs all the help it can get. There's another place where the Buddha said that the beginning of wisdom is when you go to a contemplative or a Brahmin. In that case, he's talking about not just any old contemplative or any old Brahmin. He's talking about noble disciples. And you ask those people, what's skillful, what's unskillful? What, when I do it to lead, lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, what, when I do it will lead to my long-term harm? So the teaching on skillfulness is basic. To wisdom, it's basic to your protection. And if you were to ask the Buddha about skillfulness, the first thing he'd said is one of his categorical teachings that skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. That's true across the board. And then he would expand on that in what's called the Gamabhata, the Sib Gamabhata, the entire Gamabhata Sib, the Ten Gamabhata, excuse me in English. They start with skillful actions for the body, skillful speech, and then skillful actions of the mind. In terms of the body, there's no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. In terms of speech, no lying, no divisive speech. That sometimes is mistranslated in English as slander. Divisive speech is when you're actually saying something true, but you're trying to make somebody look really bad in the other person's eyes particularly with the aim of breaking up a potential friendship or harming a potential a friendship that already exists. You want to avoid that. You also avoid unnecessarily coarse speech, and you also avoid idle chatter. That last one, avoiding idle chatter, is a hard one, because there's no clear line. On the one hand, there has to be a certain amount of what you can call social, social grease chatter, where you just help people get along, make sure that life in the group is friendly. But as we all know, too much grease can muck up the works, so you have to be very careful. There's also a tendency when you're engaged in idle chatter that the filter that normally separates your mind from your speech gets pretty coarse. It lets all kinds of things through, things that you haven't really thought of through carefully, things you're not really sure about what your intention is, suddenly it like gets let out. And you end up saying things that are untrue or divisive or whatever. And particularly in terms of your sense of humor, you have to be very careful. Just because something is funny doesn't mean it should, has to be said or should be said. You should put it to the test as well. Is it true? Is it beneficial? Is it timely? That's speech. Then there's skillful actions of the mind. The first one is no undue greed. In other words, you see something you'd like, 
realize, okay, there's there are fair ways and unfair ways of gaining that, or something like it. Right and wrong ways. Okay, you never go for the wrong ways. You always go for the right ways. And you also look at the things around you. Exactly how much out there do we really need? The Buddha has that reflection on the requisites. To remind us that we don't. Only, we only need so much food. Only so much clothing, shelter, medicine, and beyond that it becomes wasteful. So whenever, you're, whenever you find the mind wanting something, you ask yourself, okay, what's the gain? What genuine gain is there? And what's the loss? So many things in life are a trade. I know someone who built a really beautiful new Dharma Hall in Thailand. They put years and years of work into it. More recently, he's been complaining that it requires a lot of upkeep. Okay, you got the hall, but now you've got all that upkeep that has to go with it. Is it worth the trade? That's something each of us has to decide for ourselves. Second skillful action is lack of ill will. In other words, you develop goodwill for all beings yourself and everybody around you. What this means is you don't want to see anybody suffer, and you don't want to cause anybody suffering. In part of goodwill, there's an interesting passage where the Buddha expresses ways that you can express goodwill. And it's not just may all beings be happy, but may no one ever deceive or despise anyone anywhere. In other words, not only may people be happy, but more importantly, may they act on the causes of happiness. This is what makes goodwill not just a kind of airy-fairy, pink cotton candy kind of idea. And you really do want everybody in the world to behave skillfully. If there's any way you can help the other people, and that, that by the way, is how the Buddha says the most genuine way you can benefit other people is by getting them to behave skillfully, too. Then you do it. And finally, there's a right view. Basically, the view that your actions really do matter. The actions do have results, and the results go beyond this life. And this is not just a matter of hearsay. There are people who have practiced and seen that there is this life and the next life, and that there is the continuity or the continuum of the results of our actions. It goes. Sometimes the results appear now, sometimes they appear after we've died. To think in this way is the beginning of right view. It's the basis for the Four Noble Truths. Some people say there's no connection between the teachings on karma and the Four Noble Truths, but how can that be? The Four Noble Truths are about actions and their results. There are certain actions in the mind that lead to suffering. There are certain actions in the mind that lead away from suffering. And as you start out with these basic principles of what's skillful, and you find that in order to really strengthen, especially the skillful mental acts, but also your skillful bodily acts and your skillful verbal acts, you need to have a good meditation practice. Otherwise your goodwill is weak, your right views get weakened, and when there's no real sense of well-being that comes from your meditation, it's very easy to think that the things of the world are the important things in life. This is why when the Buddha would teach, he would start out with generosity and virtue, and the virtue here would cover all these ten skillful actions, and he would move on, talk about the rewards of these skillful actions, but then point out that those rewards have their, have their drawbacks if you don't have something more solid. And the something more solid is when you learn how to give up your interest in all your sensual thinking about how you'd like the world to be this way or how you'd like your world to be that way. You start thinking about your inner world instead.
This is why we meditate. The meditation is embedded in this larger teaching of what's skillful and what's not. You're training the mind so that its sense of skillfulness becomes more interior. You're not totally dependent on the rules outside. It doesn't mean that you break the rules anymore, simply that your sense of what's skillful gets more subtle. Because meditation is a kind of sensitivity training. It trains you in being more sensitive to your actions, more sensitive to the results you're getting from your actions. It helps you raise your standards for what counts as genuinely skillful. When you've internalized these lessons in this way, internalized the practice, that's when you can become your own protection, as the Buddha says. The self is its own protection, ati atahi atano nato. You can't be your protector, you can't be your mainstay until you've developed good qualities inside. And so a firm sense of what's skillful and what's not, that's your protection and your willingness to do whatever it takes to develop what's skillful. That's your protection as well. And that's based on a mind that has a good foundation and concentration, then your protection is really solid wherever you go. And because it comes from inside, you never have to be afraid that you'll leave it anywhere. Wherever you go, it's there.